I always kind of try to tie most of my videos back to that keyword. So figure out your keyword. I, I think a lot of times we talk about finding your niche on YouTube, but I think it actually goes even more granular than that. I think you really need to figure out what your keyword or key phrase is within that niche as well. That's super practical. Again, you're hitting us with the good stuff. <laughs> Welcome back to Waves, powered by Arcade Studios, a show for marketers, creators, entrepreneurs who want to stop chasing the tide and start making waves online. We're your hosts, Mike and Mitzi, and today we're joined by OG YouTuber and marketer, Latasha James. Latasha James is the founder and creative director of James and Park, a social first video marketing firm serving clients across the globe, as well as the online business Launch Lab, an education platform for freelancers and creative entrepreneurs. Latasha is also a YouTuber with over 10 years of experience on the platform. We can't wait to ask you questions about that. And seeing the rise in popularity of YouTube for creators and brands, we're excited to talk about strategy with Latasha today and everything else related to YouTube. So Latasha, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, this is cool because we've never met personally, but um, we've been part of an AMA you were on and we just were struck by your knowledge and your um, the expertise that you shared. So we had to have a follow-up conversation, um, but we can get straight into it. Um, give us a little bit of the background, like how long have you been on YouTube and what helped you initially grow on the channel? Yeah, this is my 10th year on YouTube, which in, I know you said OG YouTuber and like in YouTube years, yes. it's kind of a dinosaur. Uh, it's kind of a long time, but I started on YouTube just for fun. Honestly, this was, um, kind of, I started out doing like lifestyle content, beauty and fashion content mainly. And it was honestly just for fun. I'd always had a blog again, just for fun. I always liked writing and just kind of sharing what was going on in my life. And YouTube was kind of a natural extension of that. People would ask me for, you know, tips like beauty fashion tips that were just best displayed on video. And so that's really how I got started. I had no idea that there was this whole like ecosystem and community and business behind YouTube. So I started out of passion. I started just because it was fun. And then once I kind of started getting that, that bug for YouTube and becoming really interested in it, I kind of went down this rabbit hole of learning how to improve my videos, learning how to, you know, learning about like YouTube SEO and kind of the business side of things. And that actually is what started me um, down the path that I am now, which now I create business and entrepreneurial content. Uh, so it was really YouTube that kind of influenced me and encouraged me to start freelancing just by doing all of that SEO research and marketing research in the beginning. That's so cool and so impressive. Like, I know there's a lot of people who are coming to the platform now and starting their YouTube channels, um, but you've obviously invested so much time and your resources into learning it and perfecting it and becoming an expert in it. Has anything surprised you in that time period of like learning how to, the craft of YouTubing, like anything around like how long it takes you to grow or how you can engage with community, things like that? I think, I mean, lots, first of all, just the business that I've been able to build has surprised me. Cause like I said, it was just this fun thing. And then even when I learned that you could make money on YouTube, everyone would always say, you know, you can make money from AdSense, but it's like not a lot, you know, it's nothing that you could really live off of. That's what you always hear. And that's kind of true. Like that's only one of the revenue streams with YouTube, but I mean, there's so many other ways to make money on YouTube. Um, and, and I mean, my business really wouldn't be what it is today without YouTube. Almost all of my traffic to my course website and to my agency comes from YouTube. So I never would have expected that at all. I think on the growth side and maybe the more negative side, I, something I wasn't prepared for, I'm very much a creature of habit. And so I like to learn something, do it well, be consistent. And I definitely was not prepared for kind of the, how, how, um, how prepared for different trends and different like eras of YouTube you have to be, you really do have to evolve. I think the fundamentals of storytelling and video, they remain the same, but you know, shorts, like we could have never predicted that five years ago, or even just 
um, you know, a few years ago, maybe vlogging was more popular, whereas now it might be a different style of video. Podcasts are really big on YouTube now. So you kind of have to be flexible and evolve with the times a little bit while still keeping those fundamentals, you know, the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, being flexible, I feel like is just a trait you have to like adopt as a marketer because like it changes so much and so fast. It takes no prisoners. It doesn't wait for you. It just like goes, goes, goes. So I can see like that's definitely just a muscle you have to kind of perfect as you go. For sure. Um, Do you see YouTube now as an opportunity for creators? I know a lot of people are talking about YouTube and I think what's cool about YouTube is it's so established as a platform. So I feel like it's bringing a lot more attention and people are kind of craving a bit more long form content now. Um, Do you think it's still a good opportunity for creators and brands to jump into now, or do you feel like it's kind of too late? I definitely don't think it's too late. I still think it is such a great place to be. Um, you know, I, from a partnership side, partners really love YouTube more then that's where I can earn the highest rates with partners. I have found just because it is that, um, it, it's more of a long form, um, platform, not only long form, but it also has that stay power. I think some of the other platforms, uh, are a little bit more, you know, you really have to feed those algorithms and be pumping out a lot of content. Uh, whereas I think the impact that a brand partner has on a, a YouTube video of mine has so much more impact than on like a short form video. And I also think the same goes for your own brand. Like it's SEO rich, meaning that, some of my videos that I posted five years ago are still getting views. I just checked my comments and just got a comment um, just a few minutes ago on a video that I posted like four years ago. And they they really do that work for me. And with that comes uh, referral traffic back to my website when I'm getting those views as well. So they show up on Google as well. So I, I think it's a definitely a worthwhile investment. I think you know, we can, we can do both. And I think that's most people's strategy is to do a little bit of both. I always say like, choose one longer form platform and one shorter form platform to focus on so that the short form can really serve as distribution for your YouTube channel and help, um, just kind of widen that, that net. But definitely, I still think there's so much opportunity. And I mean, we still don't really even know what's happening with shorts. Like it's still very much in a beta phase, I guess. So I think there, there will be a lot of opportunity for short form creators there too. Speaking of short form, I, I remember with the emergence of TikTok, there's a lot of conversation for brands and businesses specifically, like creators aside, um, of like, TikTok is only a a fit for a certain type of brand. And I'd be curious what you think about YouTube specifically. Like, are there certain types of businesses or brands that are a better fit for the platform or has it been around long enough and it's more of like a longer term play, like you said, enough to the point that any business can thrive on the platform? Yeah, I think I definitely think a lot of businesses can thrive on the platform. I'll say if your business is very... um, you know, it, it it changes a lot day to day. That might be challenging just because there is some post-production time that goes into YouTube. Uh, so if, you know, you're a restaurant and your menu changes every single day, you're probably not going to be able to post like live updates, or I guess you could, but it would be a little bit challenging. That might make more sense for you to be on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or something where you can just quickly pull out your phone and, and post those updates that way. But I think for most businesses, uh, you know, there is at least an angle that you can take that has that more long-term, long-form approach. I think particularly for anyone who has a front-facing personal brand where, you know, there is a person behind the brand, I think YouTube is really valuable because I always say that when I get on discovery calls with clients for the agency or coaching clients or anything like that, they're they're pretty much sold. Like I'm really not doing selling on discovery calls anymore because my clients have already been able to really get to know me through my videos and spend as many hours as they want getting to know me and assessing a fit before we hop on a call. So I I just think it's the next best thing 
to face to face. So any type of personal brand I think does really well, but I'm also really excited. Um, YouTube has just released a few, some new monetization opportunities as well to like link and tag products in videos as well. So you know, I think product-based businesses, again, I started in the beauty and fashion world. I think there may be some interesting um, ways for them also to be linking over to their products and and earning a little bit more um, that way too. So I can't really think of too many businesses that it wouldn't be a great fit for. Mm -hmm. That's, That's really awesome. interesting because YouTube is something that we want to start taking more seriously. And I know I'm sure Mike's wheels are turning too because you have to actually – get the business for our agency. So like, it's cool to consider that like YouTube can support all of that and products too, which is something I hadn't really considered before. Um, but I mean, YouTube compared to say like short form video or social media, it feels like it, there's more obstacles in order to get started because, you know, obviously you want to have a really great tech setup and, Long form is just maybe a bit harder to do than, you know, pulling out your phone and just talking to a camera. So what have you seen in your experience working with clients and some of the people who you um, consult with? Like, what are the things that hold people back from starting a YouTube channel? And how do you kind of get over some of those hurdles? Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned equipment. So I, my first YouTube video was shot on a point and shoot digital camera. It was, I mean, it was so bad. This was like a 2005 era digital camera. Like it was not a DSLR. It was nothing fancy. Um, it was, it was really bad. And so what I'll say is our, the technology we have at our fingertips is so much better than that, than what I first started with. So I always encourage people to just start with what you have. If you have an iPhone or like a Google pixel, any of these camera phones with really good cameras, you can start a YouTube channel. Um, there's always upgrading to do. Like I still have equipment upgrades that I want to make, um, but you can do that over time. So I will say the equipment thing, like just start with what you have. If you choose to upgrade anything, I say invest in a microphone first. I think people will really forgive like iPhone quality video, but sound is is really important to people. They won't forgive bad quality sound quite as much. So if you want to make an investment, invest in a microphone, start with your iPhone and, and just get started. But I also find that when I do work with clients, you know, a lot of people will kind of use that as that, that like surface level fear. They're like, oh, I don't know if I have the right equipment or if I know how to set it up, but that's, that's pretty easy. I mean, there's so many YouTube videos out there. I have some, there's so many others out there as well that will teach you how to do that. I find it's usually more of an internal fear, actually, like when you really mm -hmm. dig deep down of, you know, we look at YouTube as a more authoritative um, platform, like people really have to know what they're talking about on that platform. And it's full of experts and really smart people. Um, that's kind of the, percep the perception of YouTube. And so I think sometimes people feel like maybe they don't have enough expertise or they don't have enough smart things to say, you know, insightful things to say, or yeah, like maybe just have a little bit of that imposter syndrome. So I say, just try to take some of the pressure off and start with FAQs. Like most people who have a business get the same questions about their business or their service or their industry over and over again. So just start by answering those questions and just taking a little bit of the pressure off and just using it like, you know, saying it like a conversation, like you're having a conversation and like you'd explain it to a friend or a potential client and, um, yeah, just start everyone. Everyone is a beginner once, so you don't have to be perfect by any means. That's so good. I feel like that's a big thing for me. Um, we've been doing this for five years, like running our agency together. And I still sometimes find like, that's the thing holding me back even from just like put it, posting a TikTok or something like that is, am I going to, end up putting my foot in my mouth or is someone going to expose me for not really like knowing what I'm talking about? But yeah, I think that's good encouragement. For sure. That's awesome. I did want to ask one follow-up question. You had mentioned YouTube shorts and how it's kind of still in this like early beta phase. And I'm curious knowing that there's often, you know, less barrier for people that are used to short form video, like because they're producing it on TikTok or Instagram. Is it possible in your opinion to be successful posting only YouTube shorts or does there need to be always some sort of longer form video strategy if you're on YouTube? 
Yeah, it's hard to say what what will happen long term. I think it's definitely possible that there will be shorts only creators who are successful. But if I had to make a recommendation to a client or a friend, I would encourage them to make, you know, at least one series, one recurring series that is long form. Um, That could be like a weekly podcast or even just a monthly YouTube video or longer reaction or something like that. Um, Just because I think there is still a reason why we have TVs, why we watch movies, you know, um, even though there may be formats that become more popular or, you know, ways that we we change how we watch those things, um, I think there's always just going to be a certain level of connection and engagement that you get from having that longer form relationship that just doesn't happen from short form content. So I think that um, having a mix of both is good. I think the other thing about long form is it actually gives you content to pull from. So that's what I create my shorts out of right now, more or less. I mean, occasionally I'll do a like a direct-to-phone camera uh, short, but for the most part, I'm just repurposing clips from my long-form podcast and long-form videos and then publishing them onto YouTube shorts and the other social platforms as well, just to kind of um, broaden my reach and like tease some of my longer-form content. So uh, it, it's it's a great investment of your time. I'm really just sitting down once a week for an hour to record, and then I have content, you know, for my whole content calendar that way. Very cool. How do you know what your audience wants to see from you? Like, I I know this is probably personal to everyone, and you know the type of business that they have and the niche that they want to build on. But are there any like types of content or things that you? feel like you need to be looking at when it comes to like how your audience is engaging with you that can inform content? Yeah. YouTube's analytics are really robust. I love them. I could spend all day in them. Um, I try not to because I I also try to just let my own creativity and like let my own um, intuition guide me somewhat and not pay so such close attention to the the numbers. So I go in like once a month and just do an overall um, analysis. And some of the key things that I look at are um, they actually show you what search terms people are looking for to go to your to get to your YouTube videos. So that's always really helpful. And then in addition to that, you can see the uh, watch time. So if somebody searches like social media strategy on my chat and then gets to one of my YouTube videos, it'll show me how engaged they are, like how many minutes they're actually watching. So that's always helpful at knowing those keywords for myself. Uh, You can also see what other creators and what other videos are referring people to your channel. So you can do a healthy bit of competitor analysis and see what other creators in your space are posting about. And sometimes that can spark some ideas. Um, And then also just like I I do some overall um, keyword monitoring, like I'll use tools like Answer the Public and Google Trends to just see, uh, you know, different keywords that are related to my niche and how they're trending up or down if there's something that I should be paying attention to or talking more about. And then lastly, actually, um, is is paying attention to their co- my comments and really being active, listening. Like I get so many great requests all the time of, hey, could you make a video on you know, the, whatever YouTube set up and I'll just do it because they're, they're asking for it. So chances are other people are as well. That's really helpful. I think it can always feel on any platform really as a marketer that sometimes you're just speaking into an echo chamber, just hoping that you're right about what people want to hear from you. But those are some really practical insights. I appreciate that. Um, and you had alluded or started to talk about, um, repurposing content, but also even like selecting, uh, shorter form channels like Instagram or TikTok for distribution um, that kind of trickles down from your longer form content. I'd love to just hear a little bit more about your strategy for distribution, but also just in general repurposing the content that you're putting on YouTube, because obviously it takes a lot of time uh, and creativity to produce that. For sure. I mean, I think one of the big mistakes a lot of people make, including myself for a long time, is like getting the YouTube video out is that end goal. And we're like, yay, we did it. And yeah. and really that's like half of half of the battle here. Cause now you have to work on promoting it and just getting and you know as much as you can out of it because it does take a lot of time, resource, you know, money if you're investing in gear. So for me, um, I batch my 
YouTube videos. I usually try to do like two to three um, podcasts when I sit down to record one. And so, you know, I spend a couple hours recording and then I will make sure that I pull clips um, anywhere from like three to five clips out of each episode. Uh, just depends on how many, um, how many pieces of information I have that can really stand on their own. Cause I think that's important. You don't want to clip a piece of a conversation that's you know, not, not really going to land. Like you have to have that full, um, hook and that full resolution to make it make sense on short form. So in my editing process, I actually, I just use markers. I use final cut pro to edit. So I just mark different areas when I'm editing that I think would stand alone really well as a TikTok or Instagram reel or whatever. And then I just go through and, and pull them out and resize them, add captions, um, and schedule them out into my content calendar. Um, for anyone listening who's just getting started, I think a great place to start is just by choosing one short form platform to really focus on at first, at least. I pretty much repurpose to all the short form platforms nowadays, but uh, I really say like focus on, on one key platform to start. Um, for me, that was Instagram for a long time. And I would just make sure that I was every Friday when I uploaded the podcast, I was also sharing an Instagram story and sharing an Instagram reel as well. And really building up my content calendar that way. Um, and just start by, you know, pulling a clip, posting that on the platforms, and then you can get a little bit more creative with it and, um, stagger your content and things like that as you, as you get into the groove with it. But that's, that's really all there is to it for me. Nice. Do you have advice? I, I'm sure you get this all the time on like how to grow your YouTube channel. Like I've heard that it's such a grind and it definitely takes more time spent on the channel in order to grow. What have you seen work well for you or even some of your clients? Like are there any tips that you can share for how to grow your channel? For sure. So number one is the boring one, which is consistency, like consistency and patience. Obviously, um, those kind of go without saying, but YouTube really does reward consistency. So again, if you can do like a weekly show or a weekly, you know, thing that people can look forward to, that really helps build that audience. And also I think helps with the YouTube algorithm. I think outside of that, one thing that you can do is borrow other audiences. So if you're starting and you don't have an existing audience on another platform or an email list or something, invite people onto your uh, your YouTube channel and encourage them to share. That's a great way to spread the word. That's one of the reasons why having a podcast is a really great idea because it gives you kind of that opportunity to invite guests on. And, uh, you know, if you target guests who have something of a following, most people are happy to join. Like, I think a lot of people, I know when I first started my podcast, I thought everyone was going to tell me no because I was a new show, but people love to talk about themselves. <laughs> and so, you know, m most of the times people will say yes, especially if you approach it, you know, professionally and in a kind way. So, that's a great thing that you can do. And even just engagement, engagement in general is something I think a lot of people forget about. Again, we think so much about creating the great content, but then what happens once it's out? Um, respond to the people who are responding to you. Even if it's just one or two comments on a video, make sure to keep that conversation going. And then also you can do outbound engagement with other creators. So if you're like a web design agency, comment on some of the popular freelance web designers, um, you know, who post content or uh, maybe it's even just kind of the aligning industries. Like if you do web design, comment on social media marketers because you're in a similar space and may actually share clientele or share tips back and forth. So doing that always in a non-spammy way, like not the, you know, when I first started, it was like follow for follow or sub for sub, like don't do that. Um, that is not cool, but just leaving genuine comments and um, just making friends, like that will definitely help grow your network. That's so interesting because to me, YouTube feels like such a beast, but the advice that you shared is just so similar to what you would do to grow your social media accounts. Like yeah. Be genuine, comment on people, and just like try to connect with more people, invite people to do like collab posts or features or whatever. Like, I think that network effect is really important, but I didn't realize that it could still happen within YouTube. I don't know why I didn't think that, but um, that's surprising. Yeah. For sure. I feel like YouTube is like that weird platform that it's social media, but it's not like it's kind of a, a weird mix, but totally. yeah, the, the rules remain the same for sure. 
Yeah. And I was curious for you when it came to growing your subscriber base, was there a certain like video or season that things like really escalated for you? Um, like if you're thinking back, is it like SEO focused, you know, um, keyword rich videos that really helped kind of get you in front of more people? Yes, absolutely. So when I, again, I started out doing like lifestyle content and made the pivot to doing entrepreneurial content, uh, really out of viewer request. Cause I started talking about my career. I'd graduated college and was just like, Oh yeah, I'm freelancing with this client. And they're like, Oh, tell me more. So I started just you know, creating videos and pivoting that way. And I noticed specifically, because at that time I was pretty much just doing social media management for clients. And when I would put social media manager, social media management, social media man- marketing, like those keywords, um, people really were looking for them. People were wanting to learn how to do that and learn more about that topic. So I really went in, I said, I'm going to spend a year going in on those keywords and um, just answering as many questions about that topic as I can. And that is definitely when I saw the biggest growth in my channel. Um, And, and, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to be like a keyword bot, basically just like, you know, spewing out social media manager answers or whatever. Like I still did it in my own way. I still varied the content formats. I would do some that were more vlog style, some that were sit down videos that I launched the podcast. I still had fun with it, but I always kind of try to tie most of my videos back to that keyword. So figure out your keyword. I, I think a lot of times we talk about finding your niche on YouTube, but I think it actually goes even more granular than that. I think you really need to figure out what your keyword or key phrase is within that niche as well. That's super practical. Again, you're hitting us with the good stuff. Um, I think this next question, I feel like I know the answer just with the way the conversation has gone so far, but I'd love to ask it anyway. Um, From your perspective, how would you prioritize platforms for creators? Um, And then the follow-up to that would be, would you have the same perspective for brands or would it be different? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's always going to come down to two things. It's going to come down to your audience. So who do you want to reach and what are your goals? Um, most people, like most businesses, creators, brands, anybody, the goal is to make more money usually, although that's not always true because if you're like a nonprofit or, um, you know, a artist, you might not even be looking necessarily for streams or or purchases of your art, but more of just like exposure and awareness. But in most cases, it's going to be increasing revenue in some way. Um, So goal and then audience is, you know, if you have a super young audience, focus on TikTok. If you have um, an audience that is, you know, my age or a little bit older, maybe it is YouTube or Instagram or even Facebook. Um, So research or or LinkedIn too, you know, research uh, the different platforms and their key demographics and like who they, who's really using those platforms to figure out where your ideal audience is going to be or where they're more likely to be. And then start there. It doesn't mean that you can't obviously be um, you know, a Gen Z beauty brand and have success on LinkedIn or that you can't be like a, you know, I don't know, CEO of a finance company and be successful on TikTok. Like you can definitely break those rules, if you will. Right. But starting where things are going to be the most likely is going to get you the most, um, you know, likely success, of course. And then I think uh, start with a long form platform and a short form platform to start with. So uh, obviously I think YouTube is extremely valuable. So I would love for it to be YouTube, but some people aren't super comfortable on video. So start a blog or, um, just do an audio only podcast, something like that. That's going to have that SEO value for you. And then also give you content to be able to repurpose from whether it's written video, audio, or otherwise, and then use that on the short form to start with. That's so good. One thing that you're doing so well in this conversation that I appreciate is just making it feel really simple and achievable. And I think the majority of people listening are probably in the same boat as us where we feel like it just seems so ominous and overwhelming. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, I'm really curious about AI. It's a big, it's a hot topic right now. Uh, We've chatted about it actually with a couple guests in the season here and there. Um, But I'd like to hear from you if you see AI playing a role in long form content creation, what that might look like, if there's any risks involved, just give us your thoughts. 
Absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely think there could be risks with AI. I think we got to be be careful, but I do think there are also some benefits to it. Um, one of my favorite tools, I didn't mention this when we were talking about repurposing, but I use a tool called Descript and that allows you to upload your video file and um, you get a transcription, a, trans, a transcript with it that you can use for like blog posts or emails or social posts. And then you can also cut down um, short form clips from it, add captions to it. You can even do um, dubbing of your voice. So like if you forgot to say something, it learns your voice well enough to be able to kind of make up like wow. what you said. It's kind of, it's kind of weird. So crazy. Yeah. But it comes in handy if you forget to say like, don't forget to subscribe or just something simple like that. Um, so my point is like, I've been using that tool for a long time, like years now. And so AI, uh, I know like there's been huge, um, developments with it recently, but it's not super new. Like there, there've been AI tools that we've been using for years. Uh, so for that reason, I'm not that afraid of it, I guess. And I, I think things like that can be really helpful. I have seen, um, I haven't really, I haven't found a great full on video editor that's AI powered quite yet, but I know they're coming and I know the technology is only going to improve. So eventually like maybe we won't have to spend hours and hours cutting down our long form videos, which could be helpful. And then I think uh, even just topics, you know, idea generation. I talked about like Google Trends, Answer the Public. Those are great options. But, you know, I I personally, uh, I know this is a hot topic, but I personally don't want to live in a world where I'm reading a book written by a robot or watching a video that's completely developed by a robot. But I think that AI can be a great starting point. So going into chat GPT and saying like, what are some popular, you know, video titles for marketing agencies or photographers or whatever your niche is, and just coming up with those ideas. Like to start with, it can kind of just jog your brain a little bit, and then you actually do the research to, um, you know, make it your own. Uh, but I think that th those are going to be the best ways, the best uses of AI right now, but we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> I totally agree. I feel like it's great as a catalyst or like kind of replacing the monotonous part of the processes, but you can't you can't replace humans and we don't want to give AI that autonomy really, to be honest. You mentioned repurposing from transcripts into blog posts. Do you do that? Is that part of your content strategy? I actually don't. I That's one of those things that I is on my to-do list is to start a blog again, but I do use my transcripts to write my newsletters. So I send out two newsletters a week which uh, is kind of the reason I haven't really started a blog is because I actually sort of use those as my blogs. So if you mm -hmm. want the like inside look at my business, that's where it is. And so, yeah, I use that as a base, you know, a starting point for most of my newsletters and then just edit it a little bit, add my own thoughts, additional thoughts to it. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's a great tip. Yeah. You, you, I feel like you have like almost like a whole media property about you. And I'm just curious, like you've talked about repurposing content, which I think is so smart and makes a lot of sense. Like when it comes to how you plan about all the things that you're doing, like your YouTube content and then social media and your newsletter. And then I know you do courses and consulting, like how do you like plan all that? And like what comes first and like, how does it feed to the other things? Yeah. So I, I usually do a big quarterly planning session. So at the beginning of every quarter, I kind of look back at all of my social reports, how everything did, and that helps me know sort of what's going on, what's trending, what performed well, um, and, and base my next quarter off of that. I would say that because I look at, you know, like my Google Analytics and um all of that, I'm able to see that most of my traffic comes from YouTube. So for that reason, YouTube is always my priority. Like I'm always going to start any content idea with how does this work on YouTube and then you repurpose and distribute it on the other channels. Uh, and then even like you mentioned, when I have a launch for a course or have a new service or something that I, I want to offer, I'm always thinking of a YouTube campaign that goes behind that to support that because it is my number one traffic driver. So 
looking at the data again and just knowing where the eyes are coming from, where the traffic is coming from will help you kind of prioritize the platforms and prioritize how you're spending your time too, because it is limited. And I mean, that's why I'm not making a ton of original like Instagram videos, because for me, that just isn't a conversion platform, but for other brands, it absolutely could be. So you got to look at the numbers for sure. Totally. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, We're getting near the end of our interview here. And one question we like to ask all of our guests is who's making waves right now and why? So this could be another creator, a brand, a client, whoever it is that is really grabbing your attention right now. Um, I was actually just on uh, another podcast recently by, um, they're called Think Media. And I don't know if either of you are familiar, but they've been on YouTube for a long time and they share just really great tips for creators as well. And we were talking a lot about repurposing content and um, just kind of observing how they are making it happen. Like they're doing such a good job. We did this kind of basic podcast interview and they went back and pulled video clips from my YouTube channel to put on their TikToks and, you know, made, made it really engaging with captions and emoji and like sound effects. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I need, this is what I need to do to really take my stuff to the next level. So I'll give them a shout out. I think they're doing a great job of repurposing all of their long form content in particular. Awesome. We'll definitely look them up too. That's great inspo. Um, And our last question here is where can listeners connect with you? LatashaJames.com has links to everything. And on social, I'm at the Latasha James everywhere, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, et cetera. (laughs) Amazing. Well, Latasha, this has been a treat for sure. Um, Really practical insight, like we said, which is something we always love on this show. Thank you for sharing and not holding back. And uh, our listeners are really going to enjoy this. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. Our pleasure. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into Waves. If you enjoyed this episode, you can hit the subscribe button, drop a comment, or give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to follow along on social at Hello Arcade, and we will see you next time.